Thank you for tuning in to this evening's broadcast of the Waterloo Warriors and the UFT Varsity Blues. And Nick Chizowski sent it forward. In front scores! Nick Chizowski. We've been hearing the name Ryan Kirk up quite a bit so far this first period, Jared, and he's actually playing on defense of the Varsity Blues. The Varsity Blues suffering, certainly on defense at least, multiple guys are out. Lindsay maintained control of the puck. In front, great save two. And the goal is waved off. Not much you can say there, unfortunate for the Varsity Blues, because it doesn't look like it went in, no. Yep. And a no goal there. Back in, everybody's falling now as the snow may be tri tripping up a few players at the end of the second period here. Campagna now. Matthew Campagna shot off the mass. Heffernan. Heffernan. Long shot right into the body. Halogen was the one that muscled it out. That's going to be flipped all the way down the ice just wide. Thompson still with the puck. Less than 10 to go. McEachern to Paul. He's got to get a shot off. The puck rolled on him again. To the other side. Campagna to the front. And the game is over. We had shots in the point that they were getting tipped, but you know we the, he could see everything and then he stopped everything. So you got to give him credit, but we tried to get bodies to the net and got to capitalize on our opportunities. They're they're a bigger team for sure, and they like to throw the body around. And I think we answered the bell well tonight. We got physical with them too, uh, and it was nice the refs to let us go. No penalties in the game, which is always nice. These last uh, four games has definitely been a step in the right direction. Uh, we've been shorthanded a lot, especially on the back end. Uh, so resting up over a break and getting some uh, some of our key players back will be will be huge. But I mean, it would have been nice to get the win to go on the break, but step in the right direction for sure these last couple of games, and uh, we can only build on it from here. I essentially live right outside the biggest city in Alaska, and uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty similar to everywhere else. Uh, it's not quite what people would think. I don't really live out in the, you know, out in the woods, and don't live in an igloo, don't ride my dog sled team to school or anything. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times I've gotten questions like that. There comes a point in uh, most youth Alaskan hockey players' careers where uh, they realize if they want to move on uh, to a higher level of hockey, they kind of have to get out of the state and, and experience the rest of the country and, and uh, start playing teams from California and Illinois and you know over here in Canada. So um, at some point, I think when I was 14, I kind of realized that I would have to move out of state. And uh, when I was 15, I got that chance, and I moved out of Alaska to play some uh, higher intensity hockey down in California. And um, so, yeah, I, I played hockey in Alaska from the time I was four to the time I was 14, and then after that, I left the state, and I haven't looked back since. <laughs> I played AAA growing up throughout my whole, say, seven, eight years from minor Adam is when you start to minor midget, and I played all in the GTA, played for the Mississauga Senators, Mississauga Rebels, and Toronto Young Nationals. So that was my kind of youth career. The OHL was a, a great uh, experience all around. Um, I got drafted at a really young age, at 16 years old. Uh, I got drafted fifth overall, and that was a great experience with the Sudbury Wolves. Um, you know, growing up, and I had season tickets to the Mississauga Ice Dogs, actually. I live like literally like a rock throw away from the Hershey Center. So it was like, I was a season ticket holder since day one, would go to games ever since I was like five or six years old, and like just dream about playing in the OHL. And me and my dad would go to as many games as possible, and just, he would try to teach me the game through those OHL games. And that's all I really ever dreamt about was playing in the OHL and nothing else, so um, being drafted to Sudbury was like just a dream come true, something I always look forward to and wanting to do. And then my four years there were great. Um, it taught me how to be a man. Um, it was good hockey all around. Uh, we also had a good run when we were there and um, just a good overall experience. I started playing hockey when I was six, seven, just kind of house league, and then moved up to double A AA and triple A uh, at eight, nine, ten. And once you turn 11 in the OHA back then, then it became more of a travel league. So I'd be going out to Kingston, down to London, 
up north of Aurelia. So at that time, my parents brought me into the MTHL, which is currently the GTHL, the Greater Toronto Hockey League. And you had 10, 11, 12 teams during that time period. And you weren't going longer than 40, 45 minutes from uh, end to end of the city. So that made it a lot easier until I was drafted at 16 to the OHL. At 16, when you, you know, you're getting ripped out of uh, your family's home and I'm very close to my parents and my two older sisters, my extended family. So it was a really big adjustment. I had a hard time the first month. And after that, it got a little bit easier. I got to go home over Thanksgiving. Then I got to go home over Christmas um, and then kind of settled in into the, into the new year, my first year. Uh, I was on the phone every day with my family and they're very close, very supportive. My parents came down every single weekend. My dad never missed a home game, so that was uh, very big in my development, both on and off the ice. So I lived, I lived in California, moved to California in 2009 um, when I was 15 and that was tough. Uh, you know, the same as anybody, the first time you move away from home, or the same for most people I would say, um, you move away from home, you're homesick right away. Uh, especially for me going from a small town in Alaska to living in Irvine, California. That's a pretty big sort of culture shock. Um, so when I was down there, I would call home literally two or three times a day just because I was so homesick. And uh, that first year was tough for sure. After I spent a year in California, I moved to Portland, Oregon, where I played for five years. And um, things definitely got easier. Uh, there were some times where my parents would have to call me after two weeks because I, hey, we haven't heard from you. It was like, I'm just having a lot of fun and you know, game after game after game after game, it doesn't really occur to me to call home anymore. You know, this kind of feels like a home to me. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that I got the opportunity to move out of Alaska and just sort of grow as a hockey player and as an adult. I uh, was looking at career paths for university and Obviously, uh, Dan Price, the one that was here, the assistant coach, was the one that recruited me. He was a great guy, told me everything about the school, how to do it, gave me some confidence as well because I was kind of nervous. I wanted to go play pro somewhere or like really go into hockey and maybe go play in Europe or something. I really didn't think of school as much, but with Dan and what he did really influenced me and I knew that going to U of T, one of the best schools in Canada and in the world, um, you can't go wrong with getting a U of T degree. When I was 20, I get, a, um, I get contacted by him through our education advisor in Portland. Um, and again, like I was, at, at that time, I'm 20 years old, I know I'm probably not gonna go play professional hockey anywhere and nobody's contacting me yet and I'm kind of freaking out a little bit and uh, suddenly I get a contact from, he says, Josh, I've seen, you, I've seen you play, I like the way you play, you know, would you consider you know, applying to come to U of T and playing for, playing for our school here? I didn't know U of T was such a good school. So when he said, would you consider coming out to Toronto to, to play, I was like, eh, like, we'll see. And I did my research and I found out you know, what a great academic school this is. And I found out the history of the team and all these guys, Tom Watt and Con Smythe and all these guys that were part of the team in the past. And, um, you know, I was, again, that was a good sales pitch. I was sold. But hockey still remains inaccessible to a lot of people in terms of the equipment that you need, but also things like the time that you need if you want to be a serious hockey player, you know, the, the access to facilities like hockey rinks. Um, <clears throat> but I think there's also the, uh, the more immaterial aspect of accessibility to hockey. Not everybody understands hockey culture, not everybody feels comfortable in hockey culture, not everybody knows you know, what it takes or how to enroll your kids in hockey. So I think there's sort of, and I think there's also the sense too that hockey culture is not culturally accessible to everybody as well, which acts as a barrier. So I think there's lots of ways in which class still present, prevents people from participating in hockey fortunate enough to play on a team where uh, the, the dad of one of the players owned a, um, owned a lodge off on an island in, down in South Central Alaska and he would sell off raffle tickets to, uh, for a five day fly and fishing trip at his lodge. So what I would do with my dad and uh, my siblings, we'd say give us a giant chunk of those tickets and I would go out door to door asking uh, people to buy raffle tickets for the, um, for the fishing trip to the lodge, so uh, through those efforts, I was able to actually pay for, I think, 
three or four years of my hockey just like putting in the hard work doing that kind of stuff. I got a lot of my equipment handed down from my uh, cousins, so it made it a little bit easier. Uh, I always wanted to do what they were doing. I had a couple of cousins older, a couple of my own age, and they're always playing hockey, and everybody was playing hockey at school, so that's kind of how I got into it and got my equipment. And then I took my nephew to buy equipment for my uh, with my sister, and I was shocked at how much the price was of equipment. My sticks I used to got I used to get from the gas station. We used to fill for gas. I'd get the odd one every once in a while, and they're six or seven ninety nine a stick, dollars. And now they're three hundred dollars a stick. So the game's definitely changed. The equipment's changed for the better, but uh, at the expense of the equipment. Uh, the trying to pay for equipment for these kids to play uh, costs are going way up, and maybe something. Uh, you know, Hockey Canada can kind of look at to bring the help the costs for parents to, uh, taking their kids to the rink. I think hockey continues to be one of the great cultural narratives, but also the cultural myths of Canada. It's one of the ways that we tell ourselves that we're Canadian is that we participate in hockey or that we celebrate hockey culture. But of course, what goes along with that is the presumption that everybody participates in hockey or everybody celebrates hockey culture, and that's not the case. So. I think it's just always been one of the cultural phenomenon that Canadians have used as a way to identify ourselves as Canadians. And sports are one of the great things for doing that, one of the great opportunities that we have to tell ourselves stories about ourselves, whether those stories are true or not. Fundamental aspects of Canadian identity are always based in this kind of insecurity. So one of, we're always looking for, at some level, things that we can tell ourselves to make ourselves feel good. And I think hockey continues to fill that role. Mm -hmm.